J.T. Crowley is Talking Books. On this show, you'll hear from emerging talent and seasoned veterans from around the world. They'll give you their take on the writing process and how to create the secret sauce of page-turning deliciousness. Let's get into that magical mixture of the art and science of creativity. Here's J.T. Crowley, author of The Smart Kids and your podcast host. Hello, I'm J.T. Crowley, and today I'm welcoming you all back to Peter Massam's second podcast interview here on Talking Books, about his books that make up the trilogy, The Learning Experience. In the last podcast, we talked about the first two books in the series, where we saw George, the main protagonist, facing growing pains around his teenage years in Nipper, and then in Moose Conquering Fear, George overcoming to the best of his ability, everybody, relationships, particularly adult relationships. And, oh, they can be tricky, can't they, everybody? Many That mainly focuses on the interactions with the opposite sex. And, yes, they can be tricky as well. But this book, the third and last book in the trilogy, isn't so much about continuation of George's struggles, issues in everyday life, but more about exploring the unique relationship between the mind and the body, so as to help and support people going through, facing the teenage growing pains and coping with adult relationships, which some sail through unscathed, but most of us don't. For us, it's like one forward and two back, especially we blokes. So let's invite Peter back to talk about what's hiding in the pages of this third book of his, Know Your Mind. Peter, welcome back. Thank you, John, and uh, good evening. Good evening. And for those of us, we have a little joke today between the two of us, because this is the third attempt today, everybody. We started in the morning, and now we've ended up doing it in the evening. <laughs> not going there. <laughs> <laughs> That's how we get there this time. Technology is wonderful. Not. (laughs) Anyway, let's have a look at this book. Peter, when I looked at this book, I thought the best way to approach the subject matter here was for us to concentrate more on the idealistic ethos of the book, the spirit, the heart of the book, you know, the message you're conveying here. Yes, we'll have a look at some of the chapters as we go along. But firstly, Peter, I want to dig around your thinkings around the preface and introduction to this book, because to me, these sections lay bare the concept of the whole trilogy. Let's start with the preface. Now, you refer to the book Nipper as more as a coming of age drama Mm -hmm. uh, with Moose conquering fear, more factual about specific events Mm -hmm. that shape a person's life like George's, and that the third volume is a kind of kind of pulling uh, everybody, all the threads together to really um, tie this trilogy down. So, Peter, talk to us through the preface and the significance of what you're revealing here and why you put it there. I felt that it needed uh, there there are prefaces to the other two books too but i felt particularly in this one um that hold on one second um i felt particularly in this one that it needed to contextualize what the final book is about which which is based on the experiences of the of the first two books in particular the the second book in in terms of the fears that can be overcome by uh, using your mind in a more proactive way than is normal. We tend to believe that the the mind is, yes, we know it's there. We know we make decisions every day. Uh, But from the experiences that George encounters, it adds up to a lot more in terms of capabilities. And what the preface does is it sets the context for the last book as being uh, slightly more academic, I suppose, in a way, because it proposes a philosophy based on the uh, 
amalgamated experiences of George as he goes through his later life. And in order to set the, the context of where I wanted to take this, uh, a lot of wider reading of the bigger picture of the evolution of the mind that had been experienced by George needed to be set. And for that, I drew on some very uh, expert advice from the past, including Bertrand Russell, uh, David Attenborough, Harari on mankind, um, and uh, uh, Hawking in his brief history of time. Because the wider picture really is how we as humans have evolved and where this possibly could have come from and what evidence there is that there have been changes through the years which have culminated in this experience in a single individual, but which is demonstrably shared by other capabilities shown by other people in the third book. Ah. Yeah. Let's still stay within the confines of the preface, Peter. You say um, it would be all too convenient to classify this work as one as um, psychology, whereas, in fact, it considers occurrences. How do you um, substantiate this thought process as if we went to, say, you know, a little chapter like um, The Agony and the Ecstasy in part one of the book, um, you know, physical well-being? Would I and the listeners see evidence of your considered um, occurrences here? You would certainly see how the mind can ease pain and uh, help in those situations where uh, one would normally be quite fearful of what was about to happen. So with the agony and the ecstasy, as you know, is... Uh, is based around both uh, laughable situations in the oh, indeed, dentist everyone. surgery, <laughs> <laughs> as well as rather more serious attention to a root canal filling or two root canal fillings, as it as it happened. Um, but the psychology part, um, uh, Russell puts it very well in that uh, philosophers down the centuries. Um, have always gone into the unknown space spaces. And once there is evidence provided uh, to those spaces, they become sciences. And psychology uh, was one of those. Uh, and the reason I I say this is this is a new philosophical philosophical perspective in book three. Um, and the second book uh is more of a psychology category because it looks at how uh, George reacts to certain situations in with the background of his mind is making those decisions, but he's also amassing knowledge of how the mind could possibly help. Let's still stick with this chapter. And I'm, I'm doing this for a reason, everybody, because... Why did you choose the storyline here, you know, around the dental trips? You know, we can all relate to these issues here. Um, was this you recalling such an event from your own life here? Uh, yes, there are strong <laughs> autobiographical links in George's uh, encounters and my own, of course. Um, and they... The... I suppose the the reason, as you say, for for doing it is that people can relate to it. It's a a normal activity, just like another chapter is relates to a business scenario uh, of a, somebody who's in a business career. It uh, so it's relatable to to everybody, and it's also um, a means of showing how those fears can be overcome with the with the capacity that the mind has to be able to numb certain uh, part, part or any part of your body um, and it proved very beneficial 
in the case of the root canal, which went not according to plan. When I had my root canal uh, done, uh, Peter, the dentist said to me, would you like to be uh, to watch? I said, you must be joking. <laughs> I said, you're <laughs> knocking me out. <laughs> I, I certainly I certainly had the um, uh, a similar um, feeling when, when somebody said they wanted to take uh, wisdom teeth out. And uh, they said, well, we'd prefer, you know, you can stay awake for this if you like, and we could just take one or two out. But the alternative option was to take all four out under general anaesthetic. And I, <laughs> option you chose. Mm. <laughs> I didn't need to be convinced of that one. No, I don't blame you. Yeah, knock me out, please. <laughs> Let's dissect, Peter, what you're talking about in the introduction. Why did you set out? Why did you set it out in this fashion? That's what I'm trying to get at. I was particularly drawn to paragraph three, uh, what began as a collection of thoughts amassed from strangely inexplicable recurrences, leading to wider possibilities of the power of the mind. That's what you said there. Enlighten us here, Peter, you know, as to why why you've said that, what's going on here, and how it relates to you know chapters in the book like the agony and the ecstasy, and say, for example, two other chapters, miles away, and evolutionary tale. They share one thing in common, I suppose, which is for the most part they were all repeatable experiences. Mm. So one thing that George came across very soon after encountering the, the, the first one or, one or two situations was that was the dependability of the outcome so yes not not just one dental appointment but of course the ones that followed um were all much happier um incidents because of the control that he felt he now had over the experience um, and it is similar with uh, with miles away. Uh, in the the yes, you you probably wouldn't have come across uh, more than once um, the person that he encountered in London. But uh, certainly, when he went out to China, the first hint, if you like, of uh, of the possibilities of communicating with each other just through thinking or by using the mind was first revealed to him and skeptic as he is he would always try and prove it again to make sure that this wasn't some kind of coincidence or just um, sheer luck and it's that that the other occurrences share with each other is that these things have never stopped since they were experienced first. They are repeated. It's it's, um, uh, you know, it's all about power of the mind, isn't it? Yes, it yeah. is. See, when I look at the, the the chapter, say miles away, you've already touched on that, and um, and leave an evolutionary tale. I'm intrigued as to why the storylines uh, you chose to put here. In an evolutionary tale, you start off by talking about our ancestors coming from the sea. And I thought, hmm. And their transition um, journey to the modern world of today. And in miles away, you're talking about how large institutions, organisations can transform themselves to create better experiences for employees and customers. So the subject matters are very different but yet, I think you're going to answer this by saying there is an underlying message here, but I want you to tell everybody. I think the one of the underlying messages is that this applies to everyone in any situation. It doesn't matter what career path you've chosen or how, which what kind of life you lead. The capabilities are are and have always been there. Uh, it's just that they're extremely underused and undiscovered for a large part. But in certain individuals, when you start encountering those individuals and talking with them, you realise that there are 
some fairly, how would you describe them? They have a different perspective on life, but they also have certain either sensory capabilities or, uh, or uh, ability to see things in a different way. Uh, one of those occurrences was with a, a, a lady that was met by George on, an, on a very mundane uh, occasion of returning a, 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 a lease car. Um, and she t- it turned out that she could well have diagnosed an, an illness with uh, George's dog. And it's and she confessed at the time that she had she felt she had this ability, but she was able to talk about it because I you know the I had had that conversation with a similar person who had uh, who was comfortable in discussing those things. And I think one of the one of the, the the problems with talking about some of these things to do with the metaphysical and the mind is that people are reluctant to talk if because they want to know that you are open to those kind of suggestions. And as long as you have that uh, openness, then people will talk to you about their, um, their sensory perception. And one, one example I quote in the book is a very recent one, uh, which I think I mentioned to you previously about uh, a lady who uh, could smell Parkinson's and has been able to smell it for some years. And indeed, first diagnosed her husband as having Parkinson's, having walked into a clinic where all the patients had Parkinson's and she went home and told her husband that she smelled like the other patients, that he he smelled like them. And that got him into uh, to see a GP and uh, it went from there. And sure enough, he did have that. And now she is working with the scientific community because they, one, they believe her, whereas before they didn't. Uh, and they have analysed the specific smells that are promoting that response in her, which is great. It is, because I mean, there's nothing like, you know, you know, the sixth sense. It, yes. It's there, isn't it, a sixth sense? I think we all, I think we all, I mean, we talk about it quite a, a lot yeah. um some more excitedly than others perhaps um but it's it when you when there's a period of reflection in anybody's life and it doesn't matter whether it's a religious belief or, or whatever uh, it usually entails shutting down from the outside world even for the briefest of moments and it may involve closing your eyes or it may not but you know whether you're a um, a sort of guru in India or, a, um, or or just somebody who wants to have time on their own, when you shut out all that noise, that's when you can be alone with your thoughts. And we have these phrases, of course, throughout the language. Um, and it's at that point when you shut that noise out that you can, and I don't mean by putting headphones on, that you can relate, if you like, to that sixth sense. Um, and Absolutely. Just, while we're, just while we're on language, John, mm. there's one, one other thing I wanted to mention, which is about the evolutionary tale, mm. is that famously in a, in a film, One Million Years BC, there were lots of people going around grunting and groaning, uh, making noises that they thought, probably prehistoric people might have made. Um, But I don't doubt there is no evidence whatsoever that that ever occurred. However, you could say, and I do believe that because I'm a linguist myself, um, that there must have been a time when language wasn't around and you were reliant on uh, gestures as suggested by Attenborough in uh, Life on Earth. Um, and he, you know, he, he mentions, for example, pointing, you know, it's something that babies automatically do. And I remember in, when I was first in France and had no, no real <laughs> decent French to use because I'd 
started it for uh, seven or eight years and got nothing uh, to to show for it. Um, that's what you end up doing, you know, to feed yourself. You you point at things. You say, "Yes, I'll have that, please." You know, in your in your best but poor French. Mm. Um, so it's something that sticks with you, and it's common, as Attenborough pointed out, across many many peoples, but peoples that hadn't come into contact with any other civilization that he had met during his career. So it occurred to me that there might have been a time, a long time ago, millions and millions of years ago, when language didn't exist, that there might have been this other means of communicating between people's minds, as well as using gestures. Yeah, and I think you could probably say twins, particularly identical twins, you know, they can almost read their, uh, you know, their other uh, twin's mind. They know what the other twin's thinking of. Yes. That's yeah, a think... powerful uh, um, scenario for you there. It is. It is a good thought, yeah. John, because there are so many studies of twins out there yes. you know, for that very reason. And I, I would not suggest because I, I would say that for sure you, there is that and and even some married couples would say that about themselves you know the one always finishes the other one's sentence or yes. you know, they they know what the other one's about to say before they've said it um <clears throat> that is in uh, in my experience that is very real very possible oh absolutely i can't think and you know the most i think one of the most famous people in the world who had parkinson's you know just touching on that one again was pope john paul ii yes um and and you know he carried on about his duties yes so, because i think you want this book to be um you i th- you know you want uh, uh, people from the scientific community to read this book don't you <clears throat> yes i, I want as many people to read it, but the scientific community, I'm looking to to engage yeah. um, in a in a realistic way to prove or disprove the findings of f- from those experiences. Um, for me, Peter, the conclusion you've written at the end of the book is um, very fundamental. You know, it's a key part, not only of this book, but of the entire series. Um, If I may read the first few paragraphs of the conclusion, and then I'm going to ask you why you put it in there. So you've got the conclusion here, and you you say, as with any business discussion, (coughs) the last item will always be the next steps to validate an idea or advance the theory. In formulating those, I would return to Hawking, 2011, page 209, who lamented the, the demise of the philosopher's role. And it's got in here, the 18th century philosophers considered the whole of human knowledge, including science, to be their field, and discussed questions such as, did the universe have a beginning? Hmm. The multi-dollar question, that one is, everybody. <laughs> I would like to restore the balance somewhat after a lull of three centuries later, to encourage cooperation and collaboration with the scientific community and quantum theorists to take account of all aspects of the universe and what it means to be human. Why have you put that in, you know, the opening gamut of your conclusion? Tell us. I I suppose it's to attract the attention of the scientific community uh, who are involved in astrophysics, uh, astronomy, perhaps, as well as the physical sciences and physics. And mm-hmm. it's really to take us a, a step back to what uh, Hawking was lamenting, which was instead of relying on observation first, which has been the uh, modus operandi of Uh, philosophers and scientists for very many uh, decades. They have turned it on its head so they they have an idea, a theory, which they think explains a certain condition 
of the universe, or it might be some mac macro microscopic uh, or nanoscopic detail, and then build the mathematical uh, calculations around it, and then see if they can see that happening in the universe. And that's really turning things right the way around to where they came from. An interesting viewpoint. And in so in so doing, one of the um, one of the, the, the crucial parts for me in his in his brief history of time was again uh, lamenting the fact that the equipment necessary to do the kind of science that's being done today is only open to a very select few scientists because it's so expensive and that limits the scope of the proposals going forward and for, for me this uh you know I, personally i would love to work with those kind of institutions to uh to quantify to provide quantifiable evidence which can be uh, and as I say, the science behind there is a chapter called the science, which goes into very current science on quantum physics, and suggests that there are certain things which, if were if were combined together, or if a different perspective was thrown on those, that could be used to prove that these things are possible. But it would have to disrupt one or two of their current theories, and. I suppose I'm <clears throat> I'm in a, a slightly um, I'm, I don't know whether you describe it as an advantageous position or whether you think I might be bipolar or something. But it it, it um, my education consists of both arts and sciences at degree level, and from from for many years at the end of my career, I thought, well, that actually perfectly describes me. Whereas if I went back to my school days, we had a survey in us at the end of our sixth form saying, what, what career are you cut out for? And it came back with uh, science for me. And there was nothing I hated more than science at that time. <laughs> <laughs> so, so much for your survey. <laughs> I think you got it completely wrong. But then, you know, 20 years later, 25 years later, hey, presto, you know, things had changed. So, I mean, Peter, do you think um, that readers, you know, once they, you know, you've read your book and they've read the conclusion and they've read all the trilogy, <laughs> that they'll see a strong evidence of your thought process here? And I'm going to be quite cheeky here. I think that the character George has got an awful lot of your own characteristics in. Am I right? Yes, I think you would. Uh... Yes, you wouldn't have to play the roulette wheel to necessarily come <laughs> come to that <laughs> conclusion. <laughs> but yes, there is a lot of autobiographical uh, recollection in there because, and the, the reason for that, of course, is that uh, it's reliant on an individual's experience, and the one that you best know is your own. Um, Having, but you also have the interaction with other people who relate their experiences to you as well, and that is why those things are incorporated in in the book too, to show how how broad this uh, this can be. In the you know, it's not just because we we tend to you know those ones the lady I talked about with sensory perception of of smell. Um, when you see that in the in the news, you tend to think oh, she's very special and she's very gifted, rather like an athlete or um, a scientist that wins the Nobel Prize. But actually, these capabilities belong to all of us. We all have that possible, you know. It's just that some will have genes which came from millions of years ago, perhaps, is what I'm suggesting. Uh, Would you um, also include in that, I've just thought of this, uh, these people that the police use, psychologists, to profile a, a, you know, a criminal so that they can come up with, how does this criminal's mind, you know, work? I think he could, couldn't you? 
Yes, I, I, I think that. I think you're right, John. But I also think that even going further than that is I'm sure a lot of policemen and detectives have had some friends who were, who were uh, detective chief, chief superintendents. They, they have a, some of them will, will have a, a foreboding as they approach property. They will know that something isn't right. An innate sixth sense. Mm. An innate, yes, and it, mm. it, you know, that will be backed up by evidence with their eyes. They will see that, you know, a window is open or a door is not the obvious things, but they will just have that, yes, as you say, an innate sense that something isn't quite right here, and therefore they'll be cautious about their approach. And finally, Peter, in the epilogue in the book, your stay in Melbourne, Australia. What was going on there? <laughs> <laughs> yes, you might you might feel as I've jumped around a bit. Um, he has jumped I'm, around I'm, a bit, everybody. <laughs> but the, the ep- I haven't done any other epilogue because this is the, this is the end of the trilogy. Mm. Um, and what I wanted to do, so I laid out the next steps in in terms of the conclusion but then I wanted to give the reader something that they could latch on to you know what when you I think what you said before you know when they put the book down after they re- read the last word what is it you want people to take away mm. and the epilogue gives that to them which is the uh, the J turn or the hook turn as some in America might call it where you come up to a crossroads and ostensibly because the tram lines are in the, you know, the crossroads as well, they take the traffic off to the left. They filter it off to the left before it turns right. Um, that happens on some of the French uh, departmental roads as well. Um, but the, the thing I picked up from that was not the uh, traffic direction or uh, <laughs> how they can manage their traffic. It was more the the effect that had on the traffic uh, slowing down to be in pace with pedestrians as they were walking up the hill. And that made a big impression on me because they they just seemed to be completely in sync with one another. Uh, You know, they were as if those people were not actually driving a car. They just happened to be part of a human race going up the hill. Um, Did you enjoy writing this book, this this trilogy? Yes, I couldn't wait to. Um, I mean, I, I think I started the first one in July last year, and this one I ended in, uh, published in fe- February, February the 8th. Yeah. And I couldn't wait to get it all out. <laughs> I've been... So, who would you like to see reading your books? Um, young, old, middle age, who? Uh, well, age is, is not a consideration. You'll, you'll be pleased to hear. <laughs> Works for both there. I don't. I don't exactly. I don't. I don't write write to that sort of age group. But the the, the first one was written in a simpler language uh, to begin with, which I think you picked up on actually in the in the last podcast. As you get towards the end of the book, the maturity of the conversation changes. It does, and that meant that. First of all, my my first desire uh, actually goes back to an introduction to a poetry book I wrote uh, not too too long ago, which was that, or no, actually it was in the introduction to the first one, Nipper, was I was, uh, I was put off reading early on by being given A Tale of Two Cities by my, gran- my well-meaning grandma. And unfortunately, I never got past page two, and I think I was aged eight or so it was completely the wrong book to give to a child of that age so I um I made the beginning of the book Nipper uh accessible to younger teenagers so the 12 13s 14s they felt like they feel they should feel that they can pick it up and relate with what's going on there and then as they progress through their teenage years, they'll see that 
you know the, the maturity of not not just the encounters but the um uh the language that's used and how you can feel disassociated from both your parents and other people around you who suddenly become for some reason they become very much older <laughs> or mm. the pe- you know when you're 19 or so you see people of 17 or 18 coming out of school at university and they just seem so young because they're if you if they haven't had any working life at all you think their perspective you've left that behind so you've got to wait for them to catch up kind of thing yeah you know and of course you know we have to emphasize here is that you to understand the trilogy you really do need to read the first book then the second then you'll understand the third everybody it doesn't work vice versa believe you me (laughs) peter it's been an absolute pleasure having you back on the show Thank you very much. And it just leaves me to say, everybody, I'm JT Crowley. Thanks for listening, watching, wherever you're in the world. Stay safe.